we're going to lose our country. It's going to be a disaster and we have to do something. If we don't have anything that ties us together, when that day comes, and you know what I mean, when the economic crisis comes, because it's coming, like what's that going to look like? It's going to be very scary. Trump, Tucker, Elon, and a Fox presenter deliver a chilling prophecy. The United States is on the brink of losing its identity and spiraling into disaster. The other is that there's a net benefit to them in destroying this country. Our public obsessions are getting increasingly irrelevant, actually. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, it's like crazy. You notice they never go after the people that cheated on the election. They go after the people that are looking at the people that cheated on the election. Think of it, right? It's a disgrace what's going on with our country. The radical left Democrats rigged the presidential election in 2020, and we're not going to allow them to rig the presidential election in 2024. We're not going to allow it. There's been a lot of complaining about this. It's clearly a destructive trend that's people, particularly children, destabilizing the society. And it doesn't make any sense. Mm. So it's making all of us irrational. But for some reason, nobody has taken the time to figure out who's profiting from this. And you've done what I think is a spectacular dive into this, an amazing overview of the economics of- Elon Musk issues a profound plea for the preservation of society, urging leaders and citizens alike to prioritize the creation of future generations. And I, I think that perhaps my biggest advice to leaders, to government leaders and to, to the people in general, would be to make sure to have children to create the new generation. And I think any incentives that can be done to incent the new generation, to make it easier for women to have children and to support the children, I think would be very wise. So over the years, politicians have given us a number of policy. We've had the war on poverty, the war on, the war on terror. None worked, but at least cats not allowed to fly. <laughs> but today, the Biden administration is giving us a new call it the on observable facts or what? We have to be very tough and we have to respect our law enforcement and we have to give them back authorization to act on our behalf. We have to. One of the things that I'm very proud of, and this was given through strength, well, some of the most conservative people wanted it, but a lot of liberals wanted it too. And Tim was one of the people that really was pressing and, and uh, his voice is very important to me. Uh, justice reform. We got that done and a lot of the African-American population has never forgotten that. Opportunity zones. Tim came to see me about that. He said, I have an idea and it's an idea that we've tested and all, but the problem is nobody could get it through. He came to me. I loved it. Reflecting on America's tumultuous history, the panel grapples with the complex legacy of immigration, acknowledging both its benefits and pitfalls. What does the majority of the country have in common with one another? Because look, if it, 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 the arc of the last century's his, American history is super, super interesting. So you have this massive influx of immigration, you know, the Ellis Island generation, late uh, 18th, or 19th, early 20th century. And it's both good and bad. We only remember the good, but there was a lot of social volatility, like a lot. Like the mayor of Chicago got in his house, it was on Wall Street, like the whole, the Wobblies, the anarchists, like the foot soldiers that were, were immigrants, working class European immigrants. And part of the problem was there was a lot of immigrants and I mean, Sacco and Vanzetti, you know, who the, the clerk in, uh, was it Brockton, Mass? Anyway, it was in Mass, outside Boston. They had been in the country for just a few years and they immediately got sucked into radical politics. Well, why was that? Well, because they weren't kind of bought in or rooted in or hadn't been fully assimilated into American society. So then you have the first world and we basically shut down immigration and we have this period of settling where like all Americans, let's th think through our civic religion, what ties us together. And then that leads into October of 29 and you do have this national crisis last for more than a decade and we didn't, and we had a successful, you know, the CCC, we like had these big programs, which I'll say this as a conservative, kind of worked in keeping people fed and focused, it gave them purpose, kept the country from, from collapsing during the Great Depression. Recalling the resilience of the American spirit during the Great Depression, the speakers stressed the importance of unity and purpose in times of crisis. So, said for me, I think 
I am objectively one of the world's leading environmentalists in terms of doing things. I'm not see so. Like I, I'm an environmentalist who does things. I'm of talk, of action, not talk. I act. So, so I feel I can say as as an environmentalist that the environmentalist movement has gone too far. And in that, if you in the natural extension of the environmentalist movement, if you go too far, you start to look at humanity as a bad thing. You start to look at humanity as though we are a plague on the surface of the earth, as though humanity is a bad thing. And in fact, there are some people who think and and say explicitly that. In fact, there was on the fr front page of the New York Times there was a guy who said there are eight billion people on Earth. It would be better if there were none, which is crazy. A freight train packed with illegal immigrants hurtles towards the border, symbolizing the relentless tide of immigration confronting the nation. We're experiencing a major shift in our population and culture. New research shows 50 million people who live in this country right now weren't born here. They came here, millions of them illegally. And it exploded under Joe Biden. Look at this. We've always been a nation of immigrants, but never like this. The disappearance of MH370. On March 8, 2014, Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 took off from Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia, bound for Beijing Capital International Airport in China. The Boeing 777-200ER was carrying a total of 239 people, including 227 passengers and 12 crew members. Many of the passengers were from China, with others from various countries, including Malaysia, Australia, and the United States. As the plane ascended into the sky, everything seemed normal. The crew communicated with air traffic control and the flight was on schedule. Shortly after takeoff, at 1.19 a.m. local time, the aircraft reached an altitude of 35,000 feet. This was when the first sign of trouble occurred. The plane's transponder, which helps ground control track the aircraft, stopped transmitting. This loss of communication was the first indication that something was wrong. Just 37 seconds later, at 1.20 a.m., the aircraft made its last radar contact as it crossed the eastern coast of Malaysia. The plane was supposed to follow a standard flight path over the South China Sea. However, shortly after the last communication, it took a sharp turn to the west, deviating from its intended route. This unusual maneuver raised immediate concerns among air traffic controllers. They were unable to track the aircraft properly, which led to confusion and alarm. As the minutes passed without contact, the situation became increasingly serious. At 2.15 a.m., the last verbal communication was made from the cockpit. The captain, Zahari Ahmad Shah, said, Good night, Malaysian 370. This was a routine message and did not indicate any distress. After that, the aircraft disappeared from radar screens, leaving authorities puzzled. By March 24, 2014, Malaysian authorities held a press conference to announce that the flight had ended in the southern Indian Ocean. They based this conclusion on satellite data, which indicated that the plane had continued flying for several hours after losing contact. This marked a significant turning point in the search efforts as the focus shifted to the remote waters of the southern Indian Ocean. The disappearance of MH370 has prompted discussions about aviation safety and technology. In the wake of the incident, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, recommended improvements in tracking aircraft in real time. The aviation industry has since taken steps to enhance safety measures, including the implementation of more advanced tracking systems to ensure that planes can be monitored continuously. As of now, the main wreckage of MH370 has never been found. The search for the aircraft officially ended in 2018, but the mystery surrounding its disappearance continues to intrigue and haunt many. Investigations into the disappearance the disappearance of flight MH370 triggered a massive and complex investigation. As soon as the aircraft went missing, the Malaysian government began coordinating search and rescue efforts. Air traffic controllers tried to understand what had happened and quickly alerted relevant authorities. The initial response was focused on locating the aircraft and determining the last known position of the plane. 
As soon as it was confirmed that MH370 had disappeared, investigators examined the last communications received from the flight. The plane's transponder had stopped transmitting, which was a significant factor in the investigation. This device is crucial for tracking aircraft and provides information on altitude and location. After the plane vanished from radar screens, the search area was initially focused on the South China Sea, where the aircraft was last detected. The Malaysian Air Force and various international agencies coordinated efforts to locate the flight. They dispatched ships and planes to scour the waters, hoping to find debris or any signs of the aircraft. The search involved multiple countries, including Vietnam, Australia, China, and the United States. Each country contributed resources, personnel, and expertise to the search efforts. As days passed without any trace of the aircraft, investigators began to analyze data from various sources. Satellite communications were crucial for understanding the flight's last movements. The Inmarsat satellite system tracked the aircraft's hourly handshakes, which are automatic signals sent between the aircraft and the satellite. This satellite data provided a clearer picture of MH370's flight path after it lost contact with ground control. Using this satellite information, investigators determined that after losing radar contact, MH370 had continued flying for several hours. They identified two possible corridors where the plane could have traveled, a northern corridor towards Central Asia and a southern corridor towards the Indian Ocean. The southern corridor was identified as the more likely route based on the satellite data available. This conclusion marked a significant shift in the investigation as it meant that search efforts would need to be redirected to the remote areas of the southern Indian Ocean. The search operation grew complex very quickly. It became one of the largest and most challenging search efforts in aviation history. Investigators had to deal with vast and unpredictable ocean conditions. The search area expanded over time, reaching around 120,000 square kilometers. With so many countries involved, coordination was vital. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau, ATSB, took a leading role in the search operations in the southern Indian Ocean, working closely with Malaysian and Chinese authorities. In addition to satellite data, investigators began examining the aircraft's background. They looked into the maintenance records of the Boeing 777, the airline's procedures, and the crew's qualifications and backgrounds. They investigated the flight's flight plan, cargo, and passenger manifest. No dangerous cargo was reported, and all passengers were screened before boarding. Investigators aimed to rule out any mechanical failure that could have led to the disappearance. The focus on the crew also raised questions. The flight's captain, Zahari Ahmad Shah, and first officer, Farik Abdul Hamid, were thoroughly examined. Both had extensive flying experience, and their backgrounds were scrutinized. Investigators looked into their personal lives, including any potential issues or pressures they might have faced. I had God on my side. It was a Saturday like no other when former President Donald Trump found himself in the middle of a harrowing assassination attempt. However, during his first live TV appearance after the incident, he did something that caught everyone off guard. He credited divine intervention for his survival, but even more disturbing was what happened right after. Join us in this video as we unravel the intriguing story behind Trump's divine shoutout and the ripples it created. The peaceful evening of July 13th was shattered when shots rang out at a public event where Donald Trump was making an appearance. The crowd was caught off guard as chaos ensued, and security teams rushed to protect the former president. In the midst of the confusion, it became clear that this was no ordinary disturbance. This was an assassination attempt. The shooter, armed with a rifle, managed to get close enough to fire multiple shots. Tragically, one man lost his life while bravely shielding his family from the bullets, and two others were injured in the attack. 
The bravery of the victim who died protecting his loved ones became a significant and heartbreaking detail of the event. In the immediate aftermath, Trump made what some are calling a profound move. Rather than focusing on his own escape, he expressed gratitude for divine intervention, crediting God for preventing what could have been a far worse tragedy. It would seem that Trump finally realizes that a large part of his base is religious. The event had far-reaching consequences. It sparked a wave of support from Trump's base, who saw his survival as a sign of divine protection. Prominent figures like Republican politician Vivek Ramaswamy and Texas Governor Greg Abbott echoed this sentiment, emphasizing their belief that Trump was spared for a higher purpose. On the other hand, the incident also raised serious criticism from opponents, considering Trump has never been a religious person. He couldn't even name a single verse from the Bible. Critics argue that he is simply pandering to his religious base. More on that in a moment. During his first rally in Michigan following the assassination attempt, an event widely covered by several mainstream media, Donald Trump made a striking departure from his usual negative rhetoric. Known for his confident and often over-self-centered proclamations, Trump surprised many by crediting his survival to divine intervention. In the live coverage, he stated that it was God alone who prevented the unthinkable from happening. He encouraged his supporters not to be afraid, but instead remain resilient in faith and defiant in the face of wickedness. However, critics are quick to point out that this is not a statement of gratitude, but more a display of his belief in his own self-importance. And they point out the contradiction of God sparing Trump and not the fireman and family man that was killed instead. This proclamation of divine intervention was not just a brief mention. Trump took to social media shortly after the rally to further express his gratitude, emphasizing that it was through God's protection that he was spared from harm in his mind. Supporters feel that this shift in tone was both unexpected and significant, marking a rare moment of humility from the former president. Trump's base, particularly his conservative Christian supporters, resonated deeply with this message. One interesting perspective came from Emily Cruz, a scholar from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Her take on Trump's statement would come to counter the fierce opposition the former president's acknowledgement would provoke in his critics. While well, we'll get into that in a moment, by using terms like wickedness and invoking God's protection, Trump tapped into the deeply held beliefs in his conservative Christian audience. These words are rich with biblical connotations and resonate strongly with those who view the world through a lens of spiritual warfare and divine providence. The implications of this shift could be profound. For one, it could strengthen the bond between Trump and his religious supporters, something that political strategists have been trying to get him to do since the beginning. It also positioned Trump as a figure not just of political but of spiritual significance to his supporters, further blurring the lines between religion and politics. However, this rhetoric also draws extreme criticism. Some theologians and religious leaders were troubled by the merging of divine intervention with political events, especially considering there is no evidence that God actually intervened in this event. They argued that suggesting Trump was chosen or protected by God could mislead followers about the true nature of divine purpose and protection. Meet Amanda Tyler, the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. Now, with such a title, you'd think someone like Amanda Tyler would support Trump's public display of the very thing she stands for, religious liberty, but no. She had some serious concerns about the rise of Christian nationalism, especially in light of recent events. She warns that blending religious beliefs with political agendas can lead to very troubling consequences. Tyler describes Christian nationalism as an ideology that tries to merge American identity with Christian identity, suggesting that the U.S. is somehow divinely favored or chosen in a unique way for Christians. For her, when one tries to imbue God's providence or God's blessing on a certain event like this, where lives were lost and lives were forever altered, this is a very problematic theology. But oh boy did she have it coming from counter-responses from firm supporters, such as Greg Abbott, Vivek, and Senator Tim Cook. Texas Governor Greg Abbott added his voice to the chorus of supporters, framing the event as a sign of divine intervention. 
during a press conference on the aftermath of the hurricane barrel. Abbott took a moment to comment on the attack, saying, Trump is truly blessed by the hand of God, being able to evade being assassinated. Abbott's remarks reinforced the belief among Trump supporters that this survival was a result of divine protection. By highlighting the notion of Trump being blessed and protected by God, Abbott echoed the sentiment that the former president's escape from harm was part of a larger spiritual plan despite any evidence of this. This framing not only aligns with the religious tone set by Trump, but also strengthens the narrative that his continued prominence in American politics is guided by a higher power. A very dangerous view indeed. But it was much bigger than that. The Biden family was brokering Russia-Chinese energy deals right under the FBI's noses. Trump advocates for energy affordability and independence stressing the importance of securing America's energy future amidst global uncertainties. If America is going to dominate the world in manufacturing once again, as it did when I was running things, you remember when they used to say, you can't have manufacturing jobs in our country anymore? I said, really, why? And we created hundreds of thousands of them. But we must be the most affordable energy and electricity place anywhere on the planet. We have to have affordable energy. Right now, we have energy that's weak, substandard, and unaffordable. It's made by the wind. The windmills rust, they rot, they kill the birds. It's the most expensive energy there is. And we have other things that are also no good. It's called the Green New Deal. I call it the Green New Hoax. One of the reasons manufacturing jobs were flooding back into the United States when I was president was that we dramatically reduced energy costs, sadly, Crooked Joe Biden sacrificed this tremendous economic advantage on the altar of the Green New Deal, perhaps because he was bribed by Communist China or because Communist China knows all of the money that they've paid him. We have a Manchurian candidate. That's what he is. He's a Manchurian candidate. They know everything about him. And he's scared stiff. He won't do a thing. I took in hundreds of billions of dollars from China, and Joe Biden's afraid to even talk to him. Under Biden's newly proposed power plant regulations, most natural gas and coal plants will be forced to shut down. By the way, they tried that in Germany, and now they're going back and building coal plants all over the place because they've destroyed Germany. They have no energy. So Germany now is building a coal plant every two weeks. And China is building a coal plant every week, every single week, they're putting up a new coal plant. Biden's identity politics come under scrutiny with Trump mocking his purported ethnic and religious affiliations, questioning the authenticity of his public persona. For 364 days of the year, Joe Biden goes around Washington telling everybody he's a Puerto Rican truck driving Jewish professor who was raised in a black church. But once a year, every year, Biden taps into his roots. He's an Irishman. There's no holiday the president loves more than St. Patrick's Day. It's the one day of the year he doesn't have to pretend he just tells folk tales from the old country. Biden's nepotism scandal deepens as allegations surface of using burner phones and aliases to conceal illicit dealings, casting a shadow over the integrity of the presidency. Fannie charged Trump with Rico in Georgia AOC. So if Rico's not a I guess Trump's fine. But honestly, Biden flies his son around the world to cut deals, invites his son's partners to the White House, has phone calls and meetings with him drops sanctions on them, greases regs for them, gets their kids into colleges, and he gets his entire extended family from sons, brothers to grandkids paid millions? Cars, cash, diamonds, expensive scotch? And he uses an alias? Joe Biden uses an alias. They use burner phones to talk. Biden's donors paid his family's back taxes. Could Don Jr. stiff the IRS and his dad's donors square it up before an election? Come on. Investigators have delivered eyewitness testimony, bank records, mountains of circumstantial evidence, plus motive, physical evidence, digital communications, photographs, voicemails. The looming energy crisis intensifies as Biden's policies shutter power plants, leaving America vulnerable and dependent on foreign sources for its energy needs. And we're playing games with the wind. This is terrible what's happening to our country. There is nothing to replace our energy at this time, not even close. It's very expensive and it's very weak. It doesn't have the power to power up those big plants that you see. 
At the same time as Biden is shutting down existing power plants, he also wants to force hundreds of millions of Americans into ultra expensive electric vehicles. It costs twice as much as what you have. And what you have is better, and it goes a lot longer. And it's a lot easier to fill up. And we have liquid gold under our feet at a level that no other country has. But they'll strain the grid to the breaking point. It already is at a breaking point. If you look at California, it's got brownouts and blackouts every single day. People can't turn on their air conditioners. And it'll drive electricity prices into the stratosphere. If Biden's policies go forward, our electricity costs will be the highest on Earth. They're already very close with shortages, blackouts and crippling inflation. Legal turmoil ensues in the wake of the Fonnie Willis scandal, with Democrats facing an ultimatum from the judiciary amidst mounting evidence of malfeasance. The president's always felt the luck of the Irish his whole career. He's failed up. But today wasn't his lucky day. A judge gave Democrats the sweetest ultimatum after a scandal rocked one of their biggest cases. Either DA Fannie Willis steps down, jeopardizing the whole Trump case in Georgia, or lover boy Nathan Wade steps down and the case goes on. What do you think happened? Lover boy packed his bags. The Biden campaign may think this is a victory, but it's not. Tucker Carlson sheds light on the plight of illegal immigrants, painting a grim picture of uncertainty and apprehension as they navigate the complexities of migration. What does the majority of the country have in common with one another? The Doppler data was pivotal in piecing together the aircraft's trajectory. The analysis revealed a southward turn, deviating significantly from the flight's planned path to Beijing. This was a startling revelation, as it suggested a deliberate change in direction towards the Indian Ocean, far from any scheduled route. The data also showed a rapid descent, indicating that the aircraft was not merely off course, but in a state of controlled, yet unusual, flight descent. What makes this information particularly striking is the absence of distress signals or communications from the plane. The combination of the satellite data and the lack of communication painted a picture of a flight that was under someone's control, yet eerily silent. This raised numerous questions. Was this change in direction a deliberate act? If so, who was controlling the aircraft, and why? The implications of this data are profound, not just in understanding MH370's fate, but also in aviation safety and protocol. The mysterious descent over the Indian Ocean has spurred numerous theories and investigations, yet the aircraft's final moments remain largely speculative. This data, however, stands as a crucial piece in an intricate puzzle, a silent witness to the flight's final enigmatic journey over one of the world's most remote areas. Number 6. Richard Jeffrey's Groundbreaking Method In a breakthrough that could potentially change the course of the MH370 mystery, Richard Jeffrey utilized an unconventional yet ingenious method involving WSPRNet, the Weak Signal Propagation Reporter Network. This network, primarily used by amateur radio enthusiasts, became Jeffrey's tool in unraveling the baffling disappearance of the Malaysian flight. Wes PRNet functions by capturing radio signals transmitted across the globe. These signals, often weak and seemingly insignificant, carry with them a wealth of information about their path, including disruptions caused by large objects like aircraft. Jeffrey's approach was to meticulously analyze these signals for any anomalies or disruptions recorded on the day MH370 vanished. His analysis was painstaking. By cross-referencing the timestamps of these signal disruptions with the known flight path of MH370, Jeffrey pieced together a more detailed trajectory of the aircraft. This method offered a new perspective different from conventional satellite data or radar tracking. It was akin to adding a fresh set of eyes on a cold case, providing new clues to a puzzle that had stumped experts for years. The culmination of his research was the identification of specific coordinates where MH370 could have impacted the ocean. These coordinates, not previously focused on in-search efforts, suggest a new location far from the original search areas. 
This revelation isn't just about finding a missing aircraft, it's about providing closure to families and potentially rewriting aviation safety protocols. Jeffrey's work stands out for its innovative use of existing technology in a completely novel way. It demonstrates how thinking outside the box, coupled with the relentless pursuit of answers, can shed light on even the most perplexing mysteries. Number 7. The Controversial Pilot Suicide Theory in the midst of the myriad theories surrounding the disappearance of Malaysian flight MH370, one particularly unsettling hypothesis stands out, the pilot suicide theory. This theory posits that Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah, the experienced pilot at the helm of MH370, may have deliberately steered the aircraft off course, leading it to its tragic end in the southern Indian Ocean. The foundation of this theory lies in the analysis of the flight path, and the sequence of events on that fateful night. After the last verbal communication with air traffic control, the aircraft's transponder ceased to function, and the plane veered dramatically off its scheduled route. This was not a gradual deviation, but a deliberate turn, as evidenced by military radar data. The aircraft then flew for several hours, suggesting a conscious effort to navigate it. Supporting this theory is the absence of a distress signal or any indication of technical failure, which would be unusual in a standard accident scenario. The route taken by MH370 towards the remote southern Indian Ocean was inconsistent with any flight paths to an emergency landing site, further deepening the mystery. Scrutiny has also been placed on Captain Zahari's personal life. Investigators delved into his background, seeking any signs of motive or psychological stress that could have led to such a drastic decision. However, it's important to note that no concrete evidence has conclusively linked Captain Zahari to the plane's disappearance. His family and friends have described him as passionate about flying and psychologically sound. The pilot's suicide theory remains a topic of intense debate and speculation. It not only raises questions about the mental health and motivations of pilots, but also highlights the critical need for robust psychological screening and support for aviation professionals. Yet, without definitive proof, the theory remains one of many attempting to explain one of the most perplexing mysteries in modern aviation history. Number 8. Cockpit Mysteries and Pilot Actions in unraveling the enigma of Malaysian flight MH370, one critical aspect that stands out is the series of actions that occurred within the cockpit prior to the aircraft's disappearance. The focus is on deliberate maneuvers that significantly deviate from standard operating procedures, primarily the potential depressurization and deactivation of electrical systems. This scrutiny leads us to question whether these actions were intentional and, if so, what could have been the motive behind such drastic measures? In 1970, only 10 million immigrants lived in America. Today, it's five times that number. Come to America and vote blue. And they're streamlining it. This is the Migrant Express. Hundreds of illegals on a freight train heading right for the border. They call this train the beast. The illegals strap on their native flags to the train as it cuts through the Mexican desert. But they're not just coming here by train. Biden's letting illegals fly into the country also. Remember Biden's broken app illegals used to cross the border on foot? Now they can use it while they're in the air. Biden let 200,000 illegals fly into American airports from Venezuela, Haiti, Cuba, and Nicaragua. They can just check in on the app from the sky. These are secret flights. We wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for a FOIA. And we still don't know where they landed. But at this rate, every big city and small town will get the New York treatment. Complete transformation to appease the illegals and their protectors. A black market economy run by giant corporations hiring illegals to deliver their food, work the factories, and pick the crops. Oh, and the CIA is in it as well. Admitting past mistakes proves difficult, as the consequences loom large and implicate the collective consciousness of the nation. What are we going to do? Number one, well, I have a lot of cash, but that doesn't mean he can take it. I mean, you know what he did? I think he looked at my cash and he said, well, we'll take all of his cash. This is all coming out of the White House. This is all everything that you see, whether it's that one or the D.A. You know, in the D.A.'s office, this? in Bragg's office, he has his top people from the 
DOJ working in the district attorney's office in New York. Nobody knows that. Everything is coming out. This is all election interference. They're trying to damage me so they can win another election. Congress's persistence in perpetuating conflicts, despite diminishing prospects of victory, raises troubling questions about political motives and priorities. If I rear-end your car and crease your bumper, I'm happy to jump out and say, I'm sorry, I can't believe I did that. But if I were to say invade under false tre pretenses and a million people and spend a trillion of your dollars doing it, I wouldn't say a word. I would never admit that was a bad idea. I couldn't. It implicates me too profoundly. The same goes for if I say locked your kids inside for a year and their brains and prevent them from getting an education. Or if I say forced you to take a vax that didn't work that very well might have hurt you. I could never admit that I did that. I just couldn't. Because if I admitted it, I'd have to suffer the consequences. Something very much like that is happening with the which has been in progress now for almost two years. We were told at the beginning that our support would allow you to beat Russia and keep Russia from invading the rest of Europe or something. Well, almost two years in, none of that has turned out to be true. It's not going to beat Russia. The only person who's been beaten in this is the United States. The U.S. is weaker, measurably weaker, because of our support for in this. That's just true. The verdict is in. And honest, rational people admit that, no matter what their previous position. But the Biden administration cannot admit that, and neither can the U.S. Congress. And so now there is, believe it or not, an effort in progress to get the U.S. government to send another 60-odd billion dollars to the oligarchs in so another generation of men, this one probably in their 50s, can in a pointless on the They're not going to win, but the U.S. Congress would like to keep this conflict going anyway. This is not something you should import from America. Please don't import the work mind virus is bad. <laughs> so the, the, I mean, essentially that to summarize maybe the work mind virus, it consists of creating very divisive identity politics. So it actually amplifies work virus, mind virus, in my view, amplifies racism, amplifies, frankly, and all the isms. And wh while claiming to do the opposite, it, it actually divides people and makes them sort of hate each other. And it makes people hate themselves. And it's also anti-meritocratic. It's not like, it's not merit-based. So you want to have people succeed based on how hard they work and the talents, not who they are, whether they're man, woman, what race or gender, what, none, that stuff is all creating, it's an artificial mental civil that is created. And it's not, and let me tell you, it's no fun, okay? It is like, woke mind virus and fun are incompatible. There's no fun in that. No joy. Woke mind virus is all about condemning people instead of celebrating people. Like when in the work, it just doesn't celebrate. It's all about condemning and being divisive and, and being just, I think it's just evil, frankly. The border's porousness and inflation's stubborn grip epitomize the nation's challenges, testing the resilience of its institutions and economy. We have a border that works less than breath mint. Inflation more stubborn than a mule trying to learn breakdancing. And a wave that makes the purge look like Bible study with Shannon Bream. So by what metric does Team Biden think all of this is working? What the White House calls their major policy initiatives, the rest of us call ideas going over like a full diaper on a packed flight. They're peeing on your foot and telling you it's raining, which is why I stopped showering with Kudlow. <laughs> yeah, does anyone see evidence of a course correction? A willingness to maybe switch it up a bit? Nope. But we're at a point that we have to ask ourselves, are all these outcomes by design? Now, I'm no conspiracy theorist, although I'm this close to proving Bigfoot was on Epstein's island. But clearly, when something isn't working and a group of theoretically intelligent people happily double down on it, there must be an explanation. And we have a few. One is the idea of fractal wrongness, the idea that your worldview is so wrong that you'll be wrong 100 percent of the time. This helps explain how people think letting us out of jail will somehow make us safer. As you can imagine, this is quite troubling for people on the other side. 
And so we bring a religious language into the mix with politics. It's actually a powerful move for Trump. By connecting himself with divine protection, Trump is showing that he is a leader guided by higher moral values, which seems to really resonate with most of his Christian supporters. For some believers, what Trump did in front of the whole world is a reflection of what the Bible says in Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Now, some people question the blend of faith and politics, and they think this could be a very dangerous precedent, considering America is a nation of many faiths. And we firmly believe in a separation between church and state. So, what's your take? So I am very worried that the instincts of a left-wing Labour Party are to use this crisis to take away our liberties and our free speech, and this is going to have to be fought. But behind it is a growing sense of unease in our country that we're losing our identity. Nigel Farage warns of a brewing storm in our cities, where division is ripping communities apart from the inside. Yeah, I mean, two things. Firstly, the violent disorder. Uh, we've got terrible division in our cities. Uh, we've got parts of our inner city now that have become completely Muslim dominated. Uh, and that has led to a lot of British people saying, what the hell's going on? Um, our country is changing fundamentally. We've had successive general elections in which the Conservatives, following Labour, promised to reduce immigration numbers, yet we saw them double and then quadruple to record numbers. Uh, we have a border crisis like you of these boats coming across the English Channel. So underneath all of this, underneath all of this, yes, you've got Muslim, Muslim, Muslim extremists, you've got some far right, you know, yobs, violent people who look for an excuse. But behind it is a growing sense of unease in our country that we're losing our identity. And that is what led to that explosion of violence the other day. Now, this is the most serious violence we've had since the Black Lives Matter protests in the wake, of course, of the murder of George Floyd back in 2020. Funny enough, Sir Keir Starmer, our Prime Minister, at the time of the Black Lives Matter riots, when police were being injured, when historical monuments were being torn down, he chose to take the knee in solidarity with the aims of those who were out doing the protesting and causing the violence. But now, the boot's on the other foot. Now it's seen to be white, working-class British people that are protesting. And by the way, I'm not defending violence in any way of at course. all. No, now he wants to take control of the narrative. Now look, nobody should use any social media platform to genuinely spread hate or incitement to violence. And, and, and that, that free speech rule, I think all of us would support and agree with. In a world drowning in lies, Farage insists that our children must be armed with the truth, trained to unmask extremism and fake news. What we are allowed to do on social media, or should be allowed to do, is to speculate, is to ask questions, yes. uh, is to try and put facts out, try and put facts out that wake up the rest of the community. And when you're engaged in something like that, you can never ever guarantee that what you say is 100% true. You may yeah. think it's true at the time. You may ask a question whether it's true. Now, Starmer, by cracking down on that, poses, I think, the biggest threat to free speech we've seen in our history. And Elon Musk, Elon Musk has caught wind of this. You yes. see, I think the reason that Musk, the reason Musk has been going for Starmer over the last week is he knows what the reaction is going to be. And can I just add, worse still, yes. there is a proposal, a proposal today that from the age of five years old, our kids in schools should be taught to spot extremism to spot fake news and misinformation, and to use their powers of critical thinking to work out what's true and what's not. Now, by the way, I believe in critical thinking. However, if the parameters that are set are to say to every kid, if you read a post that questions net zero and global warming, it will be extreme content and a lie. If you read a post that even dares to question 
levels of immigration, legal or illegal, into Britain, that that's extremist, then you start to set a narrative for a future generation that is fundamentally undemocratic. So I am very worried that the instincts of a left-wing Labour Party are to use this crisis to take away our liberties and our free speech. And this is going to have to be fought. Had the establishment been honest with us, Farage believes the chaos in the streets would have been a shadow of what it became. Yes, I mean, after the, after the triple um, of those poor, sweet little girls, um, a few hours went by. And there was huge speculation online about this man. Was he an illegal immigrant? Was he an Islamist? And no one knew the truth. Um, and I simply asked on X, I simply asked, did this man have a record? Is he somebody that the security services were watching? Um, answer there came none. Then after the riots happened, you've got the whole establishment saying that I encouraged rioting. Well, I mean, all I did was to say, please tell us the truth. Funnily enough, if they had told us the truth, the rioting would not have been anything like as bad as it was. And the authorities need to wake up to an online world. So, yes, I am currently coming under um, a serious... And many of the campaigners on the left are publicly saying that I should be arrested simply for asking to know the truth about... And I mean, Facebook are far worse. I mean, a lot of people, um, I'll, put, I'll put posts out on Facebook, factual posts about information I've discovered about, for example, the numbers crossing the English Channel by small boat. Um, and people who like my Facebook posts get their accounts suspended. Uh, so it's quite sinister, the way in which it's happening. And, and the big one for us was lockdown. You know, three times we had a national lockdown due to... And I have to tell you, by lockdowns two and three, I was absolutely contemptuous of the whole thing. And I was saying, hey, look at what Florida are doing. Look at what Sweden are doing. But, but literally, if you question lockdowns, if you said this is government taking excessive freedoms from us, uh, you would find your Facebook account suspended for a period of time. And that's the problem here. Yeah. You know, we may be talking, we, we may be talking in the wake of some pretty ugly, violent riots. But if, you, if that is used as an excuse to improve tracking technology and protocols to ensure that similar incidents could be addressed more efficiently in the future. Despite extensive efforts, the initial investigations did not yield conclusive answers about the cause of the disappearance. Investigators were left with many unanswered questions and a growing determination to seek the truth. The investigation into MH370 became a global effort, capturing the attention of the world and highlighting the vulnerabilities of modern aviation. Remembering the missing passengers and crew. The crew on board consisted of 12 dedicated professionals, including the captain and first officer. The captain of the flight was Zahari Ahmad Shah, aged 53 at the time. With over 18,000 flight hours, Captain Zahari was an experienced pilot, having worked for Malaysia Airlines for many years. He was known for his skills and professionalism, and his colleagues respected him greatly. He was described as a passionate aviator who loved his job and had a deep commitment to safety. The first officer, Farik Abdul Hamid, was 27 years old and had around 2,700 flight hours under his belt. Farik was also a dedicated pilot who had joined Malaysia Airlines in 2007. He was in the process of gaining experience to advance in his career. Farik was known for his enthusiasm for aviation and his friendly demeanor, which made him well-liked by both passengers and colleagues. The flight was scheduled to depart from Kuala Lumpur International Airport at 12.40 a.m. local time and was meant to arrive at Beijing Capital International Airport at 6.30 a.m. The passengers included people of various nationalities and many were traveling for different reasons, from business trips to family visits. Among the 227 passengers, many were Chinese nationals with 153 on board. One notable passenger was Philip Wood, an American businessman who was traveling to China for work. He had a successful career and was well regarded in his field. His sudden disappearance left his family and colleagues in shock 
as they had relied on his expertise and leadership. Ming was excited about his trip and had plans to reunite with family in Beijing. His loss was deeply felt by his loved ones, who were left searching for answers about his fate. Yvonne Li was another Malaysian passenger on board. She was traveling with her family, including her husband and two children. The family had planned to visit relatives in China. Their disappearance left a gaping hole in the lives of their extended family. The flight also included Mohamed Khairuddin, a Malaysian businessman who was on a work-related trip. He was known for his successful ventures and was well-liked in his community. His sudden loss affected many people who admired his work and character. There were several students on the flight as well. One of them was Nguyen Thi Han, a Vietnamese student who was returning to Beijing after a holiday. She had dreams of furthering her education and making a positive impact in her community. Her disappearance was a tragic loss for her family and friends, who remembered her as a bright and ambitious young woman. Another passenger was Cheng Ming, a 31-year-old Chinese national who was traveling for business, built his career and was well-respected in his industry. His loss resonated with colleagues and clients who had relied on his expertise. Among the passengers was also Zhang Yiming, a Chinese engineer who had been working abroad. He was returning home to see his family and friends after a long time away. His disappearance left a profound impact on those who knew him, and many expressed their sorrow at the loss of such a talented individual. The crew members were not just professionals doing their jobs, they were individuals with families and lives outside of work. The flight attendants included Hanafi Abdul Rahman. Each of them had their own stories, aspirations, and relationships. They were dedicated to ensuring the safety and comfort of the passengers throughout the flight, and their commitment to their roles was evident. The disappearance of MH370 was not just a tragic event for those on board, it also affected their families and communities. The families of the passengers and crew members were left in anguish, grappling with uncertainty and loss. Many families came together, forming support groups to help one another during this difficult time. They held vigils, shared stories of their loved ones, and sought to raise awareness about the ongoing search for MH370. As the news of the disappearance spread, the international community responded with compassion. Many countries offered assistance in the search efforts and condolences poured in from around the world. The loss of so many individuals from different backgrounds highlighted the global nature of air travel and the interconnectedness of humanity. In the aftermath of the flight's disappearance and the Malaysian government faced immense pressure to provide answers to the families. The search for MH370 became a priority and authorities vowed to do everything possible to locate the aircraft and understand what had happened. The stories of the passengers and crew remained at the forefront of discussions about the tragedy. The emotional toll on the families was profound. Many faced uncertainty and anxiety about the fate of their loved ones. The lengthy search process only deepened their pain as they waited for news. The families of the passengers and crew members sought closure hoping for answers that would help them understand what had transpired on that ill-fated flight. In time, the families became advocates for improved aviation safety and tracking technologies. They emphasized the need for better systems to prevent similar tragedies in the future. Their voices became a driving force in discussions about aviation regulations, and they sought to honor the memories of their loved ones by pushing for change. Wreckages found over the years While the main wreckage of MH370 has never been found, several pieces of debris that are confirmed to belong to the aircraft have been discovered over the years. Each piece of wreckage has provided important clues, but has also added to the complexity of the ongoing investigation. The first major piece of debris was a wing flaperon, which was found on July 29, 2015, on Réunion Island in the Indian Ocean. Réunion is a French territory located east of Madagascar. The flaperon was a significant discovery as it was the first confirmed piece of MH370 to be identified. The flaperon was recovered by local authorities and later examined by experts 
who confirmed its origin through serial numbers that matched those of the missing aircraft. The discovery of the Flaperon brought a sense of hope that more debris could be found, and it indicated that the plane had indeed crashed into the ocean. Following the discovery of the Flaperon, several other pieces of debris were found along the shores of the Indian Ocean. In 2016, another important piece was discovered in Mozambique by a beachgoer. This piece was identified as a part of the horizontal stabilizer, which is located at the tail of the aircraft. Like the Flaperon, this piece was also identified through thorough analysis and examination. The finding in Mozambique confirmed that the wreckage was consistent with what would be expected from an aircraft that had experienced a catastrophic event in the ocean. And our country has perceived weakness with an incompetent and corrupt leader, Joe Biden, who's laughed at all over the world. And Joe Biden betrayed it. You know, when I see Bibi Netanyahu come and he tries to talk them into doing something, they never do it. They never do it. This is a real problem. I can't imagine how anybody who's Jewish or anybody who loves it, and frankly, the evangelicals love just love it. I can't imagine anybody voting Democrat, let alone for this per this this man who's who's totally he was thirty years ago. He's more now. But the problem was all caused by crooked Joe Biden, and uh, you know he's negotiating all of these different deals. But he's not really negotiating because he doesn't have time in the day. He spends most of the day sleeping. But he can't. He can't put two sentences together. He can't do anything. He can't do anything. We have an incompetent man as our president. Worst president in the history of our country. The only one that's happy about him is Jimmy Carter. It's true. Jimmy's thrilled. But this problem was caused, in my opinion, by his boss, Barack Hussein Obama. Elon Musk highlights the remarkable growth and innovation of our times, emphasizing the boundless opportunities that lie ahead. Yeah, I think generally we, we, people should always be wary that they may have um, it, either consciously or perhaps mostly subconsciously internalized the notion of a, a zero-sum game or a fixed pie. Um, and if, if you're internalized that, 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 there's a, that, that everything's zero-sum, meaning like in order for me to get ahead, someone else has to not get ahead, um, or for me to have stuff, someone else must not have stuff, that, if, if you have that axiomatic flaw, then, 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 then that's what, what it needs to be done is to to fix that ax axiomatic flow because it is false. Um, there's, it's not a zero-sum game. We can absolutely grow and have grown, and the evidence is overwhelming that we have grown the output of goods and services. We have many things today that we did not have in the past. Um, we are far more prosperous. Uh, all of humanity is far more prosperous today than it was at times in the past. I mean, it wasn't that long ago where you know, we'd, we'd count the good year as one where well, the bubonic plague wasn't that bad, <laughs> only 10%. Um, you know, we, uh, not that many people starved through the winter. Um, we only lost, you know, 5% due of our population due to raids from other tribes. You know, basically life used to be very rough in the old days. Um, and uh, it's, if, if, if they could see us now, They'd be like, what are you guys complaining about? <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> um, you, you know, not having to worry about uh, food, food for, I mean, we were, we were food constrained uh, for you know, probably the last 100,000 years it, it, until recently. So, you know, re re really the, the present day future is, is amazing compared to the past. And anyone who doesn't think it's amazing is not a good student of history. Um, so I think we live in the most interesting of times and probably the best of times. Tucker Carlson lambasts the absurdity of today's civil discourse, lamenting the erosion of reason and common sense in public discourse. Liberals are now telling us they plan to protect American democracy, and that's the clearest possible sign that they intend to end it. 13 months from this week, the United States will hold a national election. In a democracy, citizens can vote for the candidate of their choice. That's not just a feature, it's the defining fact of the electoral system. The people rule. They can send anyone they want to Washington because they're in charge. But this year, in the name of protecting democracy, 
liberals have decided to strip Donald Trump's name from the ballot in states across the country. Trump is the front runner in the presidential race. He's currently beating Joe Biden in the polls. Yet liberals have decided that you should not be allowed to elect him president. That's not democracy. It's the opposite. It's totalitarianism. Just this morning, Donald Trump appeared in court in New York in a civil case brought by the state's attorney general that was designed explicitly to keep him out of the White House. That case is part of a larger legal barrage against Trump that so far includes a total of 91 felony counts, every one of them politically motivated. But today's civil case is especially absurd. In fact, it's hard to overstate its ridiculousness. In sum, Trump stands accused of inflating the value of collateral used to secure loans, loans that he has already paid back with interest. In other words, there is no injured party in this case. The biggest banks in the world assessed the risk and they made a profit, as they almost always do. Not a single person was defrauded. For this non Trump and his children are in the process of losing their homes and their businesses. For government and big social media yeah, companies that's right. to, close, to close down debates that they find inconvenient, then what price democracy? Despite the chaos, Farage stands firm, condemning street violence and thuggery in all its forms. Well, it's been a pretty appalling couple of days. Violence on the streets of this country that we haven't seen for a very long time. Yes, we had the riots in 2011, which were exercises in mass looting, but this is very, very different. Let's be clear. Thugs setting fire to hotels, migrant hotels with people in them, is just wrong at every level. I understand the frustrations, I understand the anger that is felt by huge numbers of people, but we do not support, I do not support street protest, violence or thuggery in any way. And that's why for 30 years I fought elections, because I believe that democracy is the peaceful way to solve problems. You know, I think it's interesting, too, that the UK and many other European countries, Tricia, are dealing with what we have seen in this country, which is a surge in illegal immigration. Uh, there's just as much anger and there's just as much frustration from a financial perspective in places uh, like England, but in other countries, too, in the EU, because of the toll on their communities that it has taken. You know who's really mad? Uh, the Irish. The real victims of mass illegal immigration are Europe's working poor. Uh, all of those costs are being put on the taxpayers in these cities. And the other issue here is that, you know, if you look at, we were talking a lot about, about Tim Waltz, uh, Kamala Harris's running mate. Uh, he was extending all of those services and more in Minnesota. And he's gotten blowback for that. He's gotten pushback. Yeah, they seem to be overlooking the needs of the native born population, which could be, you know, quite considerable, especially for lower income people. It's the lower income Europeans, the lower income Americans that suffer the most from massive illegal immigration. And that is why it is a top voting issue right now, the economy and immigration. Well, a significant protest has gathered here, hundreds strong under the Stand Up to Racism banner to protest outside the Reform UK headquarters and specifically against Nigel Farage, with many people here associating Reform UK and Mr Farage with some of the riots and violent disorder we've seen over the last couple of weeks. And in reaction to this protest, a Reform UK spokesperson, spokesperson has said that this office, the Victoria Street office, has been a postal address only for a number of years. This demonstration and the invasion of our offices in previous years by extremist left-wing campaigners has, for the security and health of our staff, meant that we have had to do this. They went on to say, the head office is not in London, and you will understand why we are not going to reveal its whereabouts, given what they describe as the thuggery and aggression of the far left, whose only thought to democratic opposition is to bully and, att and attempt to intimidate into silence. That is the reform response to this gathering here, accusing them of being a far left group associated with thuggery and violence and, and the sort of intimidation that reform has faced at its HQ in recent years. Now, there are all sorts of people gathering at this protest. It's quite a broad mix. The irony is sharp as thousands of left-wing activists swarm Farage's office, 
blaming him for riots he sought to prevent. I spoke to some people from the Turkish Marxist and Leninist Communist Party. And just to my left here, if I can take you with me, we've got representatives from the Marxist and Leninist Party of Germany, you say MLPD on that banner there. Workers of all countries unite on a yellow banner to the right as well. A man I spoke to just there moments ago told me that they had traveled to London specifically for this event thinking that they needed to gather anti-fascists internationally to target what they described as the rise of the far right in England. Well, I think many people in England will hear that and be quite disturbed that there are far left activists traveling to Britain to protest against democratically elected politicians. But perhaps we'll hear some perspectives on your say later today in reaction to that. But it's a significant gathering here and it comes as more demonstrations are occurring in Newcastle, in Glasgow, Birmingham, Manchester and of course here in London, where people are standing outside the Reform UK headquarters protesting against what they describe as inspiration for the violent disorder and rioting we've seen earlier. And during some of the speeches, I don't know if you can just about hear it in the distance, it's still ongoing, they were chanting Nazi scum off our streets, associating perhaps Reform UK with fascism and the far right. Uh, people I spoke to earlier in the crowd told me that they thought that while many people had been going through the legal system for inciting violence and whipping up violent disorder, they also thought that Mr Farage should also be held accountable for what they said were his roles in inspiring that disorder. Again, I imagine a claim, an accusation that Mr Farage would reject very severely. And beyond just the Turkish and uh, German communists here, we've also got this flag here of a swastika and symbol and it's a sort of anti-fascist football symbol there you see the England flag on the other side of the flag is a man putting a swastika into a bin perhaps then again protesters here associating reform and Nigel Farage with it's very stern and strong political messaging here very controversial obviously for that to be going on and they also were holding some flags of at that demonstration but here in central London the target and the discussion is not what's going on in but Nigel Farage and the Reform Party, that's what they're focusing on here. That's the message of the socialist workers here, and that's the message they're putting towards Reform UK. The far-right protests are branded as mere thuggery, but is this just another distraction from the real power struggles at play? I think they're, they're just easy insults to give, aren't they? You're racist, far-right, it's far-right, left-right and centre, it's the narrative, it's the government. And then, you, of course, you've got the far right who are doing all these protests. No, they're just a bunch of yobs who would have found any excuse to have a go at policing. And um, and it's great. I love the fact these photos are coming up and suddenly the impunity has gone. The safety in numbers and these yobs are being uh, locked up one by one. My concern, of course, is that um, they, by the left, the militant left in particular, uh, rubbing everyone up into the same group because it's easier and it means they can put their opposition in one neat pile. But what we've got here, you've, I, I've just realised basically has come down to you've got you're either your globalist in your left sort of thing who believe there should be a free for all and they're not worried about uh, three quarters of a million uh, immigration every year in this country of just 65, 67 million. Um, I, it astounds me how they're not concerned about that. I'm astounded that they aren't worried at all by the change of what's happening in our streets with all these fights and which is day by is day after day now. These they're not concerned. More the merrier. So it's really, really worrying that there are huge numbers of people such as myself who do not feel obliged to wander along to a protest and throw a wheelie bin at a police officer. Thank you very much. I think that's not helping at all and it's nothing to do with the subject. But I am deeply concerned and I tend to think those on the left probably live in slightly, um, shall we, leafy areas, mm. probably have their own insurance for their medical care or they have private insurance and they don't have to worry about it yet because it doesn't directly affect them. And it's other people where it's directly affecting. But they don't, I think his correspondent said earlier, the Irish one, they, they've lost their political voice. There is nowhere to put it now.